Love by Laurie Lee Love is, and makes all the rules itself, according to the multiple needs of the lover. We can all of us imagine what love should be, love being one of our earliest unshakable certainties, having nourished it since childhood as a symbol of private magic, transfixed with our special demands and wishes. Our image of love is the spell we put on others, or fancy we do at least, in order to compel them to enter that particular part of ourselves which egoism has hollowed out to receive them. Indefatigable love seekers all, spending the bulk of our energies to this end. Why then are we so often defeated, finding durable love more difficult to win than almost any other ambition. To be in love, of course, is to take on the penthouse of living, that topmost, toppling tower, perpetually lit by the privileged radiance of well-being which sets one apart from the netherworld. Born, we are mortal, dehydrated, ordinary. Love is the oil that plumps one up dilates the eyes, puts a glow on the skin, lifts us free from the weight of time, and helps us see in some other that particular kind of beauty which is the crown of our narcissism. Love also brings into our lives that mysterious apparition called style, the special fluency of our acts and feelings, so that we are dressed, while it lasts, in the flashy garments of supermen, omnipotent, supercharged. Love is also disquiet, the brooding pleasures of doubt, midnights wasted by speculation, the frantic dance round the significance of the last thing she said, the need to see her, to have life confirmed. At best, Love is simply the slipping of a hand in another's, of knowing you are where you belong at last, and of exchanging through the eyes that all-consuming regard which ignores everybody else on earth. Yet historically, they say, love is a modern invention, and largely an obsession of the temperate West. Whole nations and continents scarcely cater to it at all, and still live conspicuously well-knit lives. In much of Africa, the Mediterranean, South America, and the East, love is a fiction, a light relief, its territory confined to the faintly fizzy narcotics of folk tales and comic strips. There, the mating of the sexes is considered too important a matter to be left to sentiment or the chance effects of moonlight and so remains in the traditional hands of parents and brokers negotiating with such realities as cows or fig trees. If love or passion be present, this is a lucky bonus, the gilt edge to the marriage bond. But it is real estate, rather than romantic whim, that is thought the best guarantee of a lasting match. How then did we, of all people, fall into this dreamy snare and put ourselves at the mercy of romantic love? For the Americans and the British are among the few in the world to order their fate at its fragile bidding, who stand ready and willing at the first twinge of fancy and with an almost total lack of further inquiry to set up life together, expecting nothing more palpable in exchange than a pair of bedsheets or an electric razor. In this sense, we are romantics, and are stuck with it, I suppose, and everything seems conscripted to serve the illusion. It is propelled and fostered by almost all forms of our culture, popular pressures and social example, by art, entertainment, advertising, news, the influence of public heroes and private friends. Love's whim is the democracy by which we live, in which we all stand nakedly equal, stripped of all possessions and all advantages, save the chance favour we arouse in each other. 
love, that slick fever, strange convulsion of nerves at the physical presence of another, that incautious involvement sparked off by a trick of the light, chance propinquity or a favourable arrangement of temperatures, that sudden release of tensions and sense of magical freewheeling through a world of new and unimaginable harmonies, set in motion by no more than a curve of a lip, posture, or tone of voice. Such shaky beginnings are all that most of us need to say yes, to give ourselves up, to join another's life without measure or doubt, and start founding careers and families. But if we have chosen to live in the private grip of love, and it seems that most of us have, and remembering at the same time that there are worse masters in the world, perhaps we might ask what such love should be. Not the seeking of ourselves and others, certainly, which can lead later to mutual rejection, but in acknowledging the uniqueness of the sexes, their tongue and groove opposites, which provides love with its natural adhesive. We are so much alike, is the fatal phrase, suggesting a cloudy affair with a mirror, when the real balance that binds us is the polar difference of sex and the magnetic forces that grapple between. Perhaps the most useful service we can offer love is to respect that primitive gulf, which is a psychic need, like sleep and darkness, and the deepest store of emotional nourishment. This may not be so easy in the general mix-up of today, with the enforced blurring of sexual identities, but man still should be man, and woman as female as she is able, so that both may know the best of their natures, and not be compelled to inhabit some neutral no-sex land in which each is a displaced person. Love should be an act of will, of passionate patience, flexible, cunning, constant, proof against roasting and freezing, drought and flood, and the shifting climates of mood and age. In order to make it succeed, one must lose all preconceptions, including a reliance on milk and honey, and fashion something that can blanket the whole range of experience from ecstasy to decay. Most of all, it must be built on truth, not dream, the knowledge of what we are rather than what we think it is the fashion to be. For no pair of lovers, no pair of leaves, was ever built to an identical programme. So beware of the norm, for no one is normal, and least of all sexually. And if this is assumed, through self-censorship or ignorance, it may only lead to intolerance, shock and outrage. If love be true, love always consents, providing one is honest and reasonably lucky, and never attempts to emasculate or straitjacket a passion simply because it fails to fit the conventional posture. In sexual love, there is no one rule that demands what love should be, only, ideally, the dovetailing of oddities which love welcomes and combines. Some, of course, are the possessors, and some are the possessed, some placid or deeply devious, seeking in the arms of the other their mother-daughter brides or fathers, heroes, gods. Some need the spirit only, vessels for adoration, for comfort, peace and calm, while others must be taken physically with tooth and claw and can only be damaged by misplaced mercy. All such is right, if love is right, and the anarchy is shared and neither person is used simply as the other's victim, but as one whose needs should also be cherished. Love approves, allows and liberates, and is not a cause of moral correction, nor a penitential brainwash or a psychiatrist's couch, but a warm-blooded acceptance of what one is. At the same time, modern love offers another liberation, 
which few societies can have known in the past. The union of two people exchanging equal rights, rather than the coerced mating of man and chattel. For the first time, it is possible to imagine it even-handed, a true duality, freed from ancient divisions when custom, superstition, poverty and fear set the sexes obscurely apart. Here could lie the foundations of a new serenity, a new level of sexual pride. The girl, knowing she was chosen for herself alone, and so able to expand through all the versatilities of love. The man able to respond, knowing that his choice was a woman, and not a share in a flock of goats. The comforts of science, the release from animal drudgery, frees us, if we wish it almost, to make an art of love, giving us time to explore and balance our pleasures with a nice adjustment between passion and boredom. The sum of love is that it should be a meeting place, an interlocking of nerves and senses, a series of constant surprises and renewals of each other's moods, a sharing of the gods of bliss and silence. Best of all, a steady building from the inside out, from the cosy centre of love's indulgences, to extend its regions to admit a larger world where children can live and breathe. This seems promising ground, yet the hard fact remains that love today fails more often than it succeeds, a failure surely less due to original sin than to a tragic fault of the times, or more likely to a combination of faults, the decay of instinct, a misunderstanding of love's basic nature, over-sophistication and loss of innocence but chiefly the intolerable pressure of the age. Love needs to seed in a certain space and quiet, and even marriage requires some single-mindedness. The present machine-jigged world allows little for this, having lost the magic and mystery of distance, being shrunk, overcrowded, filled with the racket of voices, never still, never leaving man alone. Even worse, it provides us with all too much inflation of experience and fragmentation of desire, stuffing our senses each day with so much more than we need that natural hunger is reduced to impotence. Frantic mobility, mass communications, the drug fix of pop music with its electronically erected virility often keeps a lover at such a pitch of second-hand fever that normal flesh and blood contact palls. In the calm, empty spaces of other times, a boy made good with the girl next door. Now the crowded campus and swarming life of the city sees him half paralysed by proliferation of choice. In Jane Austen's day, the world was the parish, and a pair of lovers could stand alone in the landscape. Now they share it with some thousand other illegible acquaintances, in a dementia of equal temptation. Taking up, putting down, unable to decide or hold, constantly deluded by sight and surface. Such conditioning, of course, is also the fracture of marriage, with a switching of partners like automobiles, a modern compulsion with little to show for the exchange save the junk heaps on the edge of life. We are all victims of this, but perhaps the main cause of failure still lies in our attitude to love itself, that it is good only so long as it pleases, and that as soon as it drops one degree below the level of self-satisfaction, it is somehow improper to attempt to preserve it. This is but a natural expression of that contemporary fallacy, the divine right to personal happiness, the rule of self-love to be enjoyed without effort at no matter what cost to others. Whoever gave us this right to be merely happy, and what makes us think it's such an enlightened idea? In claiming the sanction to withdraw from any relationship, 
the moment our happiness appears less than perfect, we are acting out a delusion which results in the denial of everything but the most trivial kind of love. Worse still, it makes a paper house of marriage, flimsily built for instant collapse, haunted by rootless children whose sense of incipient desertion already dooms them to an emotional wasteland. Indeed, the interpretation of rights that allows the jettisoning of children in furtherance of their parents' right to happiness not only cancels that happiness, but makes more than reasonably certain that the next generation shall be denied it too. Of all the pressures that threaten the wholeness of modern man, the fissures in love are the most foreboding. There is not less of love, but less continuity in it, shallower grounds for its survival. Love must be deeper to adapt to the shifting sands of the world, able to withstand disaffections and occasional betrayals, be sufficiently constant in the centre of orgy and bedlam to create its own area of sacred quiet and also be strong enough to take marriage its toughest test and to sink the best of its virtues in it, so that its children may be heirs of its proper kingdom rather than the frail castaways of its self-absorption. Some readjustments of attitude may be necessary, of course, such as the abdication of the need for power and the giving up of the prize-fight relationship which particularly in marriage consists of scoring points and knocking one another down. Also in no longer thinking of the woman as substitute mother or hostage, nor of the man as haltered stud bull or mug, but in recognising each as an extension of the other's honour, where the impoverishment of one is a loss to both. For love still has intimations of immortality to offer us, if we are willing to pay it tribute. If we can learn to forget the old clichés of jealousy and pride, which are just as hammy as the demand for happiness, and not be afraid to stand guard, protect, acquiesce, forgive, and even serve. Love is not merely the indulgence of one's personal taste buds, it is also the delight in indulging another's. Also in remembering the lost beauties, perhaps briefly glimpsed in adolescence, of such simplicities as tenderness and care, in feeling able to charm without suffering loss of status, in taking some pleasure in the act of adoring, and in being content now and then to lie by one's sleeping love and to shield her eyes from the sun.